later on. And in fact, as you can kind of see, the way this class is structured is we have a topic, and in every topic we sort of mix in a little bit of flash here and there, just what makes sense, you know, play it by ear. Um, one of the things that we're going to get to, especially when we start talking about Flash as a user interface, is interactivity. All right? So I want to introduce sort of that concept to you um, as we start talking about user interfaces. Um, the, the, you know, when we, generally when we talk about typography, we're talking about developing something that's relatively static, that is a poster. All right? User interfaces, to a large degree, add the component of interactivity to a lot of what we've learned as far as typography goes. So let's talk about interactivity in Flash. And believe me, if you don't catch this, don't worry about it, because we definitely will talk about this more later. On the other hand, if you want to experiment with this, you're welcome to do so. Let me copy uh, down from Angel. Very little animation I did. That used sprites. And I think I talked about sprites before. Sprite animation is, is what was done in a lot of sort of older uh, 2D looking video games where you simply have a series of drawings that are called sprites and you can go and you can bring them on. For example, in this case, I think I went out. I don't remember exactly how I found this. But I just Googled and I looked for sprites and I found a sprite of Mega Man. Might have been this one. <coughs> Let me look real close. Excuse me. I think, yeah, I think it was this one because I took and I got him climbing. So I essentially went in and I, I, I downloaded this image and I broke each of this big image down, this, this um, one giant image, I broke it down into each little images. How do you do that? You Just using a photo editor. Um, you can go and, uh, again, uh, let me go and save this um, image to um, the desktop. You would use the photo editor of choice. Um, yeah, exactly. Oh, is that what you did? Like, you could do that in paint, just crop it? Uh, you could do it in paint. Um, later on in this course, we'll talk about the GIMP and Photoshop. But yeah, just essentially go in and, and just yeah, crop, save, crop, save, exactly. Now, with the GIMP, I've used the GIMP just briefly. Mm -hmm. There's not like a lot of, there's like no like manual or book. Nope. <laughs> so you just gotta like spend time. Yep. Ask for your money back then. <laughs> <laughs> you already got it. Yeah, there, there, is, uh, there are a lot of tutorials uh, on the GIMP online, and if you, if you Google a particular thing, you can, you can uh, find it. Okay. There used to be a tool, but I think it sort of slipped out of date, called GIMP Shop, which was the GIMP using the interface of Photoshop. So what was nice about that is you could go and uh, any documentation you saw about Photoshop would apply to that as well. But here, yeah, you just have to go and, uh, and, and insert it. That would be sort of the downside, I think, of, of open source, uh, is that you're not necessarily provided with tons of documentation. Uh, but the upside is, is that there are communities of people that, that are very zealous about this and are willing to help you. So in this particular case, what I would do is, as I was doing this, I would go in and zoom in quite a bit. That's maybe too much. I would 
would zoom in and I would go and highlight that, select it, and go up to Crop to Selection, and Save As. just so happens, the developer of the sprite deliberately created it with a transparent background oh. so that you could incorporate this into any any sort of scene that you wanted to. So yeah, it wasn't accidentally done that way. It was oh, definitely okay. on purpose. Done that way. But there are sprites that don't have that transparent background for some reason. Um, if that's the case, then, then what you'd have to do is you'd have to make it transparent. Let's show how you might do that. Um, one thing, for example, if you have a, let's go and let's say this guy is a JPEG. Because JPEGs do not support transparency. So let's open that. And let's save it as a JPEG. Usually what it will do is it will make the background white in that case. It gave you the warning saying that it can't save that as a, a, uh, uh, as a JPEG because there's transparencies involved, therefore you have to export it. Then I could go in and edit this guy. And what I could do is I could make it transparent. Now how do you make it transparent? Um, first thing you do is, is again, and, and we will review this. Um, when we talk about image processing, but this is a really a good thing to do because a lot of times folks want to do this sort of thing. So I think, I think I may have even mentioned this or ran through it once in class or in lab, but it sort of bears repeating. What I'm going to do, first of all, is on the layer, I'm going to go to transparency and click add alpha channel. I will then go up and say, select by color, and click on that to select everything that's white. Then I will go in and simply clear out everything that's white, and voila, I have... You went to edit and it said clear out? Yep. And now we have our sprites with a little bit of things that might not have been exactly white. Now, depending on how um, much of a perfectionist you are, you could always go in with the erase tool and erase those. actually sort of a, just a, divi a diversion. Now back to the main event. If you ever um, are on a Windows machine and unzip a file that I created on my Mac, you'll see like extra files like that. Uh, just ignore them. All right. And for example, I'm just going to drag that one file over. All right. 
and you'll see in here, again, first of all, you'll see the six different steps of that uh, that I had copied from the, the Mega Man Sprite, a brick wall that I downloaded from somewhere, And I have the animation, but what's different about this animation is this animation doesn't start until you click on Mega Man, all right? So, let's go and run this. Mega Man just stands there ready to go until we click on him. At what point he starts climbing up the wall and drags himself up to the top. Now, that's a little different than anything we've done before in class, and that's really sort of the next thing that we're going to do. Uh, ne our next big thing I'm going to do as far as animation is adding interactivity with it. All right? And that involves the use of something called action script. Now, if you remember, when you go and you create uh, an animation, it asks, you, it asks you what version of uh, action script you want to use, what version you want to create, and we picked action script 3.0 in this class, all right, which, is a, which is a newer version. All right? If you look, I'm going to try to move this. This frame and this frame have a little A on top of the dot. The dot indicates a, a keyframe, the little A indicates that there is action script associated with it. In other words, there's code associated with that. Now, what I just wanted to do today is sort of uh, introduce you to the concept, and you're welcome to try to take it and adapt it on any of your assignments, but it's not necessarily a requirement uh, until later on in the course. If we click on this, click on that frame now, and say, view actions, what we actually have is we have a little snippet of code here that, first of all, says stop. All right. What do you suppose that does? That stops the animation. All right. That stops the animation. Um, every animation we've done so far in this class, as soon as you went and hit play, it went and did its thing. And it went from frame one to frame two to frame three and so on. The fact that in frame one I have action script that says stop means that this one isn't going to do that. Instead of starting off uh, individually, uh, or, or immediately rather, it's going to wait for something to happen. I also stop Mega Man. All right? If I did not do that, what we would have is Mega Man climbing in place until we were ready to let him go. I then add a little piece of code that's a little confusing, but what this says in effect is when I click on Mega Man, do these instructions. And what do those instructions do? They tell Mega Man to play his animation, so they get Mega Man start moving his climbing action, and on the main timeline, jump ahead to frame two and start playing the animation. So when I click on Mega Man, he starts his little motion. In addition, the main animation goes to frame two and plays. In the very last frame, all the action script does is, again, stops the animation, stops Mega Man. All right. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. That clear, that white rectangle, what word do you use? Right there. Um, that is a good question. Um, it, I, I don't know specifically like why that is, except for the fact that that is the end before the, the keyframe. Okay. I think it's just showing a duration. Okay. I just didn't know what it was. So if we look Mega Man himself, if we double click on him, he has this little animation where he goes through his climbing bit. We stop that along with the main animation 
We stop both of those in frame one. When we click on them, we start the Mega Man doing his thing, and we start him climbing up the wall. Now notice when we do this, we haven't used this in any of the other ones because we never have written any scripts. But notice that I have an instance name for this Mega Man, MM1. We can have a bunch of Mega Man on our page. All right. I can go and drag on. Let me make another layer. I can go on to this, drag on this layer, a bunch of Mega Man. Well, which one do I want to click on and which one's going to move? Well, the one that has the instance name of MM1. The other two don't have instance names, so therefore they're not going to have their action happen when I click on this guy. So, if we go and run this, the other Mega Men are going to be like climbing in place. This is the one that when we click on it will go and it will do it and it will actually tween itself to the top of the wall. I tweened it, yeah. His motion just goes like that and it moves up a little bit. But the, uh, the tween is what takes him from the bottom of the wall up to the top. If you notice the other ones, they move up a little bit. but Because that little motion is built into their mini animation. It's the bigger tween that takes them to the top. Now, I would suggest that you take a look at this, spend a few minutes investigating it, and see if it's something that you could uh, implement a small example of. You know, maybe make a ball, go back to the first example, the ball that bounces across the screen, and um, change it so that it doesn't start bouncing until you click on it. All right? Um, if you're having trouble with this, um, don't worry about it. You don't absolutely have to use this technique, but it is something that we're going to be using later on in the class. So, again, if you want to sort of preview it, um, it would be a good time. I actually didn't get as far as I would like to today. Next time we will wrap up a bit on developing user interfaces, and we will um, um, probably start uh, discussing audio processing, which is sort of our next, um, our next topic. All right, we'll see you over in